Coming up on Theater Talk. Michelle Sweeney was voted class clown in my class in high school. <laughs> Where is she now? Is she on the off-Broadway? <laughs> I seriously doubt it, Michelle Sweeney. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Our guest is known as the Queen of Mean, but now <laughs> she is a playwright and starring in her first off-Broadway play, <laughs> Stuffed, a play I'm reading. It's opened for you, Why but you not for us. <laughs> Thank you. You two are like more brutal than I am in we the comedy scene. No, no, I'm telling you. He, Here's our guest. No one knows who, what her name so is. No idea. I'm so famous. She doesn't have to say it. Michael's the butcher of Broadway. Did you know that? I certainly did. That's yes, why I'm scared yes. to death right now. We still don't know her name, Susan. She's a guest. Lisa Lampanelli. The very beautiful, gorgeous, and I have admired Lisa. you from afar for so many years. Oh, how nice that you, you stayed are, away. You are marvelous. <laughs> But you have written Stuffed, a play about women's stories of, of body obsession yes. and food obsession. And I must say, you and I both having lost in our lives significant amounts of weight. Yes. Welcome to bulimia very, talk. Yes, right? No, 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 no. Are very interested in this topic. Now, well, the thing is, I uh, had struggled with my weight from age 18 when I went to college till age 50. You look great now. Oh, thank you. I lost 107 pounds four mm -hmm. years ago and kept it off. And I uh, had gotten the surgery to get rid of it. But then you find out, oh my God, now I have to work on keeping it off. And like the source of why I ate, which was emotion. Yeah. So to me, it wasn't like, oh, I'm Italian, so I eat a lot. No. It's like, I'm lonely, let me binge. No. So basically, the show grew out of that, of, of the struggle with food. And I have never met a woman who hasn't had a struggle with food, body image, and a lot of men have also. So I was like, oh, this is going to be cool. A lot of it is imposed upon us, although I do think that food is also a physiological addiction. You know, See, that it's, it's hardwired into our brain. I'm going to say I agree with you, yeah. but I don't. Okay. <laughs> no. Please, take her out. Take her down. No, what I wonder, I don't ever view it as, as up there in addictions with, like, alcohol and drugs, because that, to me, seems impossible. But food, I think, sugar has an addictive quality, I think. But I think for me and a lot of other people, it's just like, oh, my God, I'm uncomfortable with my feelings, so I eat. So what's funny about it is, like, I lose the weight, and I suddenly think, oh, my God, my life has changed. I'm going to get asked out. I'm going to have confidence. No. You don't grow confidence just from losing weight. So that's sort of what the play came in, where I go, you know what, let's, let's, let's uh, unmask this whole struggle for everybody. And it's four women, great actresses, and they just all play these different people yes, with these we've things. We've got Anne Harada. Yeah, Anne Harada, oh my God, she's so great. She plays, plays the big girl who uh, loves herself. Because honestly, how many big girls have you met that really legitimately it's have confidence? It's, it's very tough. tough. Look at you, Lisa, you, you're a big girl, but then, you made it, you, you know, you didn't say, oh, I'm going to stay this way, a big girl. Well, and I you also, went to a point where you got off. Well, I was yeah. worried about my health, yes. too, because oh, yeah, honestly, yeah. my ex-husband and I, at the time we were married, we went to the doctor when we hit 50, and we said to the weight loss surgeon, you know, should we get this operation? He goes, how many people do you know who weigh what you do when they hit 70? Yeah, and, and that, like, kicks in when you're 50, going, oh, my God, I wanted to live 40 years, not 20. Okay. Did you ever read a Fat is a Feminist Issue? I certainly did when right. I was 20. And such an important book, which made the point that many women are so appalled by the way they're treated in this culture mm -hmm. that, they, that they wall themselves off with weight mm -hmm. and, also, and also walling off unwanted sexual advances, well, yes. i.e. rape. Well, kind what's interesting yes. is I went to, I tried everything to lose weight yeah, before yeah. the operation, which is why I felt morally okay doing the operation, right. saying I've exhausted all other things. You put in the time. Right. So, yeah, 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 after 32 years, you go, I'm done. <laughs> I go to this food addiction rehab place once. I check myself into this place for 28 days in Arizona. So it's very high-end rehab. And they said how many women in here had, had unwanted sexual advances. Mm. There was like 40 girls in there. Everyone raised their hand except me. First of all, I felt left out. <laughs> Secondly, no, but really, I go, wow, this is, food is a way of saying, okay, step back. 
And I figured out, I don't want to have people step back. I want people to be closer to me. Like I really want to be somebody that people can talk to and relate to. So we don't need the fat. We can have voices to say no. Who, Is this a comedy though? You know what's funny? It has, <laughs> you know, Alan Joy Bell. Yeah, I love Alan. I love him. He helped, this was going to be a one person show. Mm. So Alan and I were working on it as a one person show about me. And I didn't find it said enough about this whole issue. Like I didn't want to just put myself out yeah. there. I wanted to like help all other types of people. So Alan had said to me, and I remembered this, he goes, do not worry about the funny. It's going to come out. Mm -hmm. He goes, write it all serious. And then in rehearsals and then in rewrites, it just gets funny without forced. You know how that is right. when you force a laugh? Yeah, yeah. So anything that seemed like a Lisa Lampanelli punchline, we took you out. Took out right. And now in rehearsals, when things come in, we go, oh my God, that's great. I was flattered by, we tried this at the Westport Country Playhouse as just a reading, and then right. we did it at Sag Harbor at Bay Street, and both audiences, I was so happy, said, um, you can really write because all four women sound so different. Yeah. I was like, oh, thank God. Because I didn't want to do just me. I could just do stand-up the rest but of my you life. Make it's so easy. You doing just you. I mean, are you kidding? Nobody goes into theater to make dough yeah. unless you're him. I mean, come on. the Westport Country Playhouse, Honey. my dear. <laughs> <I've seen laughs> That's not happening there. You're quite well for yourself being Lisa Lampin. I'm quite I'm wealthy, wealthy, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I could afford this beautiful Hamilton dress. <laughs> I wore this for you, by the way, because I know that's you know, your favorite you know, I show Hamilton. ever. I, know, it's yeah. I made that show. I made, I made that show. <laughs> but now, nowhere without I'm my so success. obsessed with Hamilton, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, you are. He hates oh it. Oh, my God. I, hate, I love it so much. I went opening <laughs> night, by the grace of God. I, I got invited through the producer. And I will tell you, I have not seen a musical since because I feel I would be cheating on Hamilton. Michael disliked Hamilton so much <laughs> that he wrote about it and they canceled their appearance here. And that's the truth. Their appearance here? Yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, why did you hate it? I just have to know between us. Well, I, listen, I, I, my tastes are my grandmother's tastes. Oh, um, I see. Sigmund okay. Romberg and Richard Rogers. You know? Okay. So I, I can't love that too. I can't pretend to be I'm hip to rap music, yeah. hip hop. So I didn't like it at that level. And well, then when, when I really turned on it was yeah. when everybody else in the media was slobbering all over it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a contrarian. People. Once you oh, love it that. so much, <laughs> I've got to find a reason to hate it. Now, but, Lisa. Yes. The so a more important feminist conversation That's coming yes, right here. Yes, I sense something. Here's Susan. Here she goes. You can hear it coming. The funny <laughs> fat woman is a stereotype, mm -hmm. which you certainly made hay with mm -hmm. big time. Yes. Now that you are a svelte woman. Yes. Yeah, have you lost your act? <laughs> no, <laughs> thank God. Okay. I'm, even if I lost 100 pounds, which I did, I'm never going to win a beauty contest. I'm never going to be a model or freaking Miss America. I still have a lot wrong with me, like physically and mentally. So I still have enough the audience can relate to me. So I always feel like just because you lose weight doesn't mean you're not funny anymore. And but a lot of a lot of heavy people mm -hmm. are. We used to be heavy. Funnier mm -hmm. because they had to be when they were children. Well, yeah, Shoot, I, okay. I always said I developed a personality because I was never the one who you were going to ask out because I'm a looker. Yeah. I mean, yeah. certainly now I'm phenomenally gorgeous. Exactly. However, <laughs> I've grown into myself, you know. Did but you develop the, the queen of mean persona when you were a kid? Were you running down the other kids and mocking? Her? Oh, no, no, no. I think what happened was I do remember making fun of teachers a lot. Well, that's that's makes you very popular. Yes, yes, they like that. Well, the teachers don't, but the students think right. it is good. But you also piss me off. Michelle Sweeney was voted class clown in my class in high school. <laughs> Where is she now? Is she on the off Broadway? <laughs> I seriously doubt it, Michelle Sweeney. Before we go, I do want to say you were on the Celebrity Apprentice. Oh my God, I, I sure was, honey. Sure were. Are you going to be in the Trump cabinet? You know, I don't think so unless I'm <laughs> Speaker of the House or Master of the House. See, I'm a Broadway gal. Are, you are you allowed to express any feelings about this, uh, the, the uh, possibility? That well, I'm president? allowed to do anything, thank God, because I'm self-employed. Yeah, so right. who's going to really <laughs> fire me? All I could say is, well, I got really mad at Trump when he insisted that Obama come up with the birth certificate. I thought that was very negative. So I say the only reason, the only way Trump can be elected is if he produces a document that says what the hell that thing is on his head. Because I have no idea and I got to study it for 16 weeks. You did, order. you really looked closely at that hair. And 16 it, weeks? Did you ever see him comb it? I have never seen anything touch that thing. But I want to ask, did you did you think of him? As I mean, a you, chief you, executive? You, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you were all there. You, you you were all there for us to say, "Oh yes, Mr. Trump," and yeah, and, yeah, and, I, and I, I thought I thought his treatment of you was. Yeah, but I did stay on to the top. You did four, you were there for and quite a while? I earned yeah. 130 grand for the gay men's health crisis. All right. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. after I took my 75 percent cut, it was fine. <laughs> but but but, <laughs> but, you, but sounds like it comes you know. from the Trump Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> you were with him a lot. I mean, is that? 
possible at all to your mind that he should be president? Oh, I don't think so. I thought it just got out of control. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was like something that he was, that the Republican Party was like, you know, just joking around. Well, you know, Michael Moore said that this was, he was trying to get a higher salary from NBC. So he said, okay, I'll run for president. So he went ahead and did it. And then uh, people across the country, many of you may be our viewers, <laughs> supported him and there he is. Well, let's put it this way. If they come to see my show. You will love them. I will vote for Trump or Hillary, whoever you tell me to. <laughs> so people come see my show. Discount, discount <laughs> and stuff it. for the basket of deplorables. <laughs> Wrap it up, Susan. Lisa Lefman. End it all, Susan! And I'm just very sorry you didn't take any pot shots at Michael Riedel, the, the butcher of I Broadway. can't. I want to get him to say nice things about me. Everybody exactly. I saw oh. him on Smash. Everybody was scared of him. Oh, oh. Did you have fun, by the way, on Smash? I had a great, you know, you know what all the right. best part about it? Mm -hmm. I had my own trailer. Oh, that's the With best. my name on it. I I love being cool. in the trail. I love being in the There's trail. There's something about it. And this you'll be a big one. You have your own bathroom in No, there? I had a half either. Uh, well, you'll you, be you there. You talk. Next time, I'll get you a better one. You'll, you'll be, be there again. You'll negotiate for me. Lisa okay. Lampanelli. The play is called Stuffed. <laughs> Come see it. Where, where, what theater is that again? McGinn Cazal, the Women's Project, or now they call themselves the WP. WP. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't know why, but whatever. All right. All right. Thank you for being our guest on Peace Talk. Thanks, pal. I'll see you in your trailer. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Susan, there is a great new book about the theater, the um, musical theater. It is not my book, Razzle Dazzle, I must say. It outranks me on Amazon. It is called The Secret Life of the American Musical, How Broadway Shows Are Built by Jack Viertel, who is the uh, senior vice president at Jujamson Theaters, one of the um, companies that owns all the Broadway theaters. So welcome to Theater Talk, Jack. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And congratulations on the success Thank you of the book. So uh, The Secret Life of the American Musical Theater, what does that title mean? What well, is you know, the title came to me in one of those flashes, and I thought, that's a good title. <laughs> and, it, and it reminded me of, uh, of, of when we were doing, when we were developing Smokey Joe's Cafe, and I said, the title of the show is Smokey Joe's Cafe, which is a song that's not even in the show. <laughs> right. And everybody said, why? And I said, because it sounds like a title. <laughs> so this sounded like a title. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, the underlying reason for the title is I think that there is a there is a, a pattern of structure that s supports a lot of musicals mm -hmm. all the way going all the way back to Oklahoma and beyond and going all the way forward to Hamilton and beyond and you can find these same patterns in many many shows and so that is when we're building shows now and I worked I've worked on a lot of new musicals um, we're semi aware of that pattern and sometimes when we find a solution to a problem it turns out it's the same solution that many other shows. That Rogers so, and Hammerstein found Rogers 40 years ago. <laughs> so I thought, well, it's a secret language in a way, and even we don't know we're speaking it a lot of the time. Give us a couple of these key moments in the structure of a show that you have found all of the great shows have, have in them. The key rule that I think people tend to believe is an inviolable rule or an almost inviolable rule is the idea that a show needs an active protagonist who's trying with every fiber of his body and soul or her body and soul, more often her actually, mm -hmm. to achieve something and that there's a very big resistance to the achievement. And so you have a, a contest that's worth watching. And you can uh, give us an example of... And uh, Well, Gypsy's the most famous example probably of all because you've got a woman who is bound and determined to make her two children stars in vaudeville and a vaudeville is dying and is going to be dead by the time these two girls are grown up b they're not talented and c <laughs> she's crazy right so there's a lot standing in the way of her achieving this goal and that makes it interesting but I that's mean, an interesting point though because we do think of the big character who wants something right but it's not enough to want it you've got to put the hurdles in the way there, for the right. drama there, there have to be hurdles and the hur one of the things i discovered sort of one of those discoveries i was talking about is there's a whole kind of sub genre of shows that have hurdles beyond the hurdles. And they're in some ways the most interesting ones. And I, I'm, I'm thinking of two in particular. Uh, Hairspray, mm. which is about a girl who wants, to, uh, who wants to dance on a TV show. That's her want, right. Right? right? And a third of the way through the first act, she gets to dance on a TV show. <laughs> right, Theoretically, right. the show is over at that <laughs> right, point. Right. But what she discovers when she gets to the TV studio is that the show is segregated and that there's tremendous uh, prejudice against uh, allowing the African Americans in her, even in her school to appear except once a month, which is so insulting. And she goes from wanting to dance on a TV show to wanting to integrate the whole world. Right. And so <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, I call it the hill beyond the hill. Largely, there's your second act. Largely because there's a song and a musical we did at Encore is called There's a Hill Beyond the Hill, but not, you know, private jokes <laughs> abound in the book. Um, and 
My Fair Lady is the same kind of structure. My Fair Lady is about a girl who wants to speak proper English so she can work in a flower shop, right. and a man who wants to teach her in order to win a bet. Right. Well, they win the bet, right? She learns. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out he's created her. She's a new person. What's he supposed to do with her? Right. What's she supposed to do with now, herself that she has, now. now that she has all the accoutrements of being a, an upper class lady, but none of the well, foundation yeah. behind it, you know? So there's a hill beyond the hill, and that, also she's that's always fascinating. With, she's dealing with his incredible contempt. Right. She, well, she's dealing with his incredible contempt and the fact that they actually, in some inchoate way, have feelings for each other, yes. which is, well, makes it, the show interesting. What about um, these moments in the show? I thought this was interesting, too. They're sort of breathing moments where, you know, you've got the plots moving along, but you need that time for the audience to relax and not give them so much information, but to just enjoy a moment. I think that's true, and I think it comes from uh, the artists who make these shows gradually over long periods of time, understanding sort of the biorhythms of the, of the audience. They know that after they've introduced a hero and introduced a world and maybe set up a love story and set up the hurdles, it's, you have to have recess. We all have to have recess, right. you know, right after third period is recess. And so you get numbers like put on your Sunday clothes and Jubilation Tea Corn Pone from Lil Abner, for those who know Lil Abner. Um, and, <laughs> and there's and one in Guys and Dolls, too, where they're is it when they're in Havana? They're yes, you no, that's that later. Was, that's later in the you act. You call that the tent pole. Yeah, that's later Havana. in the act. But there, but there, but there is one in Guys and Dolls, and it's called a bushel and a peck. Right, ah, right, exactly. That's you know. it. Yeah. Um, and almost all these shows have them, and they need them. The audience needs it. Now, in your book, you emphasize uh, five key musicals: Gypsy, My Fair Lady, Guys and Dolls, Little Shop of Horrors, Hairspray, and The Book of Mormon. What do those have in common? Well, they're, yeah. they're very well-written shows, and they all use many, many of these patterns um, to their benefit. And, but I have to say, they also are just shows that I love and I had enormous fun writing about. So while I enjoyed discovering and working on many other shows in the book, I kept coming back to these mm -hmm. uh, five shows. And to be fair, uh, I taught for about a decade at the Tisch uh, School at NYU, and those were the shows that were easiest to teach, easiest and most rewarding to teach because they demonstrated to the students all, all of these ways in which people build shows. This thing called the concept musical, yeah. Steve Sondheim, Hal Prince, Company Follies, is it ignoring some of these rules or if we will look closely, is it still following these rules? Some of them ignore some of these patterns. I, 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 I refuse to call them <laughs> rules or formulas. <laughs> right. um, but you find that some of the, these patterns turn up anyway. I mean, if you look at the, at the, at the, at the right, well, you mentioned tent poles, which is something, a term that I use to talk about the fact that b before the end of the first act, usually the audience needs a big burst of energy just to get them through that last 10 minutes that leads to the horrible crisis that can never be repaired, <laughs> right. which is then re usually repaired in act two. Um, <laughs> So you look at a song like Another Hundred People from Company, which right. is not a big production number, right. which a tentpole usually is. It's usually the Motherhood March from Dolly or, uh, you know, Tevye's Dream or something like that. Um, or the entire revolution in Hamilton is basically a tentpole. Um, <laughs> comes, you know, 10 minutes before the end of Act One. Um, and, uh, and Another Hundred People functions exactly the same way, even though it's a solo, even though it has two little scenelets in the middle of it it brings down the house and it, and it energizes the audience and gets them to the, final, the curtain, the first act curtain. Is so some of these concept musicals do that in various ways and some of them actually just have managed to ignore certain things. So give me an example of a concept musical that has ignored some of your, of your patterns. I think Follies ignores a lot of them. You know, a show like Chicago ignores a lot, 1776 yep. ignores a lot, but they don't, the parts that they don't ignore, interestingly, are the parts about the biorhythms, where the audience needs a burst of energy, where the audience needs to sit back for a little while. Right. They may do it in a way that has nothing to do with how you would plot a story, a typical musical theater story, but they still tend to respond like, oh, we get it. We gotta wrap it up, but I wanna ask you, because you've been around a lot of shows in development, um, working at Jude Jamson, Into the Woods, and Jelly's Last Jam, Hairspray. Is there a moment when you're in that rehearsal studio where you realize it's all coming together and it's going to be good. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when it's bad, I, there must be also a moment well, it's when it's not yeah, coming it, together. It certainly <laughs> happened with Hairspray. When we first heard the first act of Hairspray just read, I think everybody felt, oh, this is, this, there's work to do on this show, but this is a hit show yeah. in a way that 
many, many other shows I've worked on, even some of them turning out to be hits, didn't right. feel that way. Uh, fascinating stuff. The book is The Secret Life of the American Musical, How Broadway Shows Are Built by Jack Viertel. If you're thinking about writing a musical or if you just love musicals, got to read this book. Thanks for being our guest on Theater Talk. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much. Me. When's the movie coming out? Uh, Tuesday. <laughs> 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 timing, timing. We are here at 42nd Street and 8th Avenue for the beginning of the ride. Here with me is the creator of the ride, entrepreneur Barnon Richard Humphrey. Well, thank you for joining us on the ride today. Actually, the ride in masquerade. We have a very enthusiastic crowd getting ready to board with us. How long did it take you to outfit this bus? Well, this bus is $1.5 million. It has 40 video screens, 3,000 LEDs, the software to run a Broadway show, surround sound, floor-to-ceiling glass, shake technology. So we buy the chassis and totally create the top of it from scratch. We currently have four vehicles. We're planning to get two more in construction, lickety-split, because we desperately need them because we're sold out. We have about 12 companies of actors. We employ about 120 performers everything from dancers to jugglers to improvisational people and then we have about 25 people in management you know doing the mundane things like selling tickets getting press you know the things that really keep everything lubricated for us where are you from Japan Japan we are from Germany Germany and everybody hi everybody all the riders all right <laughs> Renee you are the chief driver for the ride how many rides do you do a day four or five Wow. Sometimes six. Yes, we are moving, so everyone, please, I sense you care about your lives, so let us put our seatbelts on before we begin. Actually, you know what? If you're having a hard time finding your seatbelt, that's because there are no seatbelts. We do not care about your safety. We care about your fun. Everyone, are you ready to get the ride started? What's going on? What's that? Hey guys, I'm the ride. Oh, the bus talks. Oh yeah. Because you're about to experience the greatest place in the world. Canada! This oh. is New York City! In three, two, one. It's a city of friends, a city of overwhelmed by the parasites, down in sight. We want to share the stories when the body's trying to be the hunt to it. Now look down, because here is a great view of Times Square. Oh. And speaking of Broadway, we're heading toward 42nd Street here. This is the ride's favorite musical. It's 42nd Street. The overture is We're in the Money. We're in the Money. Uh, we're in the Money. We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. Jack, Just you away. guys. <laughs> Wow, nice really good. Nice job over there. You know what? Everyone loves the song, so let's shoot it out to the streets, huh? What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Oh, But I'm feeling this energy It's how we gotta rock A little hip hop off of the top cap You know we can never stop that It's like this and we keep it fresh Gotta give a shout out to the folks here from PPS Yes, you know I'm feeling beautiful Like I stepped out of Matilda A little theater talk suitable Yes, it's How much is scripted? Wow, I would say like half. 
Yeah, it's pretty mixed. It's uh, some of the script is uh, set in stone. It's like a nice like skeleton outline. Yeah, and some of the jokes are old standbys that we've heard and learned from each other from a long time doing this. But then a lot of it, especially the stuff that happens outside and audience work is very improbable. We have a lot of first timers here and we do not want you to get overwhelmed with our amazing city. Can you Without scan doubt, New York City? Affirmative. Excellent. Subject, New York City. Wow. Population of city, 8.3 million. Number of taxis, over 13,000. Number of taxis when you need one, zero. <laughs> Country's largest city since 1790. Country's most awesome city since day one. Starts raining. Look at the New York Woo! hear you. I'm leaving today. <laughs> I want to be a part of this. Alberta? New Feel free to ask us any questions. Have a great time in New York, and uh, fine, I'll see you again. Have a good life. <laughs> <laughs>